This is my 7th gen HP microserver. It is pretty old, but honestly, it's still not too bad for a basic NAS. It's decent. Just decent. That's why in this video, I'm going to do my very best to modify, modernize, and maximize the potential of this old server to turn it into not just something useful, but something truly unique. To be clear, I'm going to make plenty of mistakes, but with some creativity, perseverance, and a bit of luck, we just might make sparks fly. Scratch that, there will definitely be sparks, and not just the good kind. Alright, so the premise of this video is pretty simple. I have this HP ProLiant 7th gen microserver, which I looked at recently and it's not that bad, but it is well over a decade old. And so my thought, and the original reason I actually bought this was to upgrade it with some modern components because the case is actually pretty sweet. It has four drive bays, which isn't that exciting, but on the back, it also has dual PCIe slots or just room for a dual slot card. And it also has a DVD drive, which granted might not seem that exciting in 2024, but a lot of people still do have DVD and Blu-ray collections that they might want to digitize. So my thought is that if you could modernize the system, pack it full of some hard drives, add a Blu-ray reader with some flashed firmware so you can rip 4K Blu-rays, and maybe even drop in a pretty beefy graphics card, you could have a really sweet media server in this nice little package, but there are a couple of issues. First of all, this case is pretty beat up and pretty ugly. So one of the first things I wanna do is not just clean this up like I normally would, but I actually want to not restore it, but I'd like to repaint this case to not only make it look much better, but also make it look a bit unique. The other much more serious issue is that the motherboard that normally slides into the bottom of this thing is not a standard motherboard. And this tray that it mounts to doesn't support standard motherboards. And the I.O. cutouts on the back are very clearly made for this specific proprietary motherboard. That being said, most of the other components in this system are all fairly standard, so I figured with a little bit of elbow grease we could overcome those proprietary issues and drop in something like this little N100 motherboard from ASRock. But the problem is, this won't fit. Even if I were to mount this to this tray somehow and slide it in, if it was centered in the case, you can see it would block the PCIe slots. And if I shifted it over so that it doesn't block the PCIe slots, well, the motherboard would be sticking out the side of the case. With that realization, I started to think that I was just going to scrap this project entirely, but then I remembered that I have this guy. This is just a little Intel 11th gen Nook that was sent over by an awesome viewer. Thank you so much. And uh, I hadn't really done anything with this, partly because, well, this case is pretty beat up. And I also accidentally made it worse about five minutes before filming this. So, my thought... Okay, well that took substantially longer to get out than I was expecting. <laughs> the case was kind of bent up around it. I forgot where I was at. I actually forget where I was at now. Um, this is a little 11th gen i7 Nook board that should very easily be able to go on this tray and fit underneath here. And while this might not look like it has a lot of ports and stuff to be able to work with a system like this, it actually has a good bit of expandability. First of all, it has a Gen 4x4 NVMe socket that we could use for a variety of different cards, but it also has this B key M.2 slot, which says SATA, but it actually supports one lane of PCIe Gen 3. And then underneath the by 4 NVMe socket, we also have another M.2 E key slot, which should also support one lane of PCIe Gen 3. With a few different little adapters, we should be able to make this work with not only the optical drive and the four SATA hard drives, but I'm also hoping to add a PCIe slot. And on top of all of that, this comes with two and a half gig networking, which isn't crazy, but should be plenty for a server that's primarily built around storing and streaming media. Now there are obviously going to be some challenges here. First of all, we have to figure out how we're even going to mount this in here. And then we're gonna have to figure out all of those connections and if they even work with the hardware that's in here. And then I'm gonna have to figure out all the little things like power button, USB, B ports, the IO on the back. So I have a few plans and I think I'll kind of explain those as we go along. But I think the first thing I wanna start with is actually making sure that all of the hardware components will actually work. So I wanna hook this up to the back plane, hook it up to the Blu-ray drive, and make sure that's gonna work all in conjunction with the power supply that's built in here. So let's get started with that. Okay, so this is kind of a ridiculous setup, but I have the little uh, nook right here, which I found that these drive caddies actually work as a great little, uh, test bench for them. 
Uh, but that's just hooked up to this monitor and currently has a live image of Ubuntu plugged in and it can boot up to that just fine. And now, because this backplane actually uses a mini SAS connector, I have this little M.2 to mini SAS, which is, has a little four channel SATA controller on there. And uh, you might be wondering why that was plugged into this SATA port, this B key port. And that's because it actually should work. Now this only supports one lane of PCIe Gen 3, which would be about 800 megabytes per second or so, which if we have four hard drives plugged in here, that's going to definitely saturate that if all four drives are being read from or written to. But there's a really good chance I'm going to run Unraid on this, so it really shouldn't matter because realistically only two drives are going to be accessed at any point in time. But we actually have to make sure it works. Now to power the drives, they're hooked up via these Molex connections to the power supply from the NAS. And to make sure that this powers on, I have this little add to PSU right here, which basically works as a relay to turn this power supply on when the main board turns on, but it also should help us have a common ground between all this stuff and the motherboard. And to actually trigger that relay, I just have a SATA to Molex adapter hooked up to the little SATA ribbon cable for the two and a half gig drive for this. This might be a bit of a mess, but let's give it a shot. Okay, here goes nothing. Hmm. Dang it. So it seemed that the add to PSU might only work with a 12 volt signal. That would be fine for a standard power supply, like it's designed for, but not so much for the 5 volts coming from the SATA port on the NUC board. Assuming I could sort all of that out later, I sorted the pins to power on the HP power supply just to test out the M.2 to mini SAS adapter. Sure enough, the adapter showed up in LSPCI, so I awkwardly hooked up a 3.5 inch hard drive, powered everything on, and boom, there's our hard drive. So with a bare bones proof of concept working, I decided to move on to the case. Okay, so I'm out in my garage and I apologize for the audio quality, actually. It would probably sound a lot better if I used this Mod Mic Uni 2 from today's sponsor, Antlion Audio. If you're not familiar, the Mod Mic is a high quality microphone that can easily be attached to any pair of headphones. This is perfect for me because I don't have to use the mic from a crappy headset. I can use the nice headphones I want, and then whenever I need to, I can convert that into a headset for work, gaming, or whatever else. And it doesn't just work with headphones. You can technically mount the mod mic to a VR headset, a 3D printed ear mount, or pretty much any other flat surface. They have options for everyone. For example, the mic I'm using here, the Mod Mic Uni 2, has a simple 3.5mm connector. With the use of a simple adapter, you can hook this up to pretty much any PC, console, Steam Deck, or pretty much anything else that has a 3.5mm combo jack. Or if you want to connect via USB, you can use the Mod Mic USB 2, which can connect either through USB A or USB C. And if you're wanting to use a Mod Mic for VR, or maybe just wires aren't your thing, there's the Mod Mic Wireless as well. And I don't really think I need to say much about the audio quality because, well, I've recorded this entire segment in my echoey garage and I think the results speak for themselves. So please, don't be the person in your game chat or Zoom call with the terrible sounding mic. Upgrade to a mod mic by clicking my link down in the description. All right, as much as I wish I could continue recording this whole video with this mic, uh, it's gonna be a little awkward, so. We'll just have to go back to the shotgun mic on the camera. So the reason I'm out in my garage is because I actually want to start working on this case and making it look better. And that might sound kind of weird to start working on this while the rest of the project looks like that. But this is probably going to take quite a few layers of primer and paint, and I could be working on the rest of the project while this is drying. So I think for this first day, I'm primarily going to be focusing on this case. Now before I filmed this, I removed the stickers and the rubber feet from the bottom with the help of uh, some hot air. And I was going to try to go ahead and remove these plastic side and bottom panels because you might not be able to see, but they have little clips that hold them in place and it looks like they should be able to essentially just slide out. But as much as I try to push down or lift up on any of these little retaining tabs, I can't get this to slide out. But fortunately, I think the bottom, the sides, and the back are all going to be painted black. So really, I think I can start sanding stuff down. Nope, not yet. If you remember, the rear I.O. on this thing is very much proprietary, so I needed to, well, cut it out. After safely and properly securing the case to my very sturdy workbench, I used an angle grinder to start cutting out a hole in the back. After realizing that angle grinders scared the absolute crap out of me, I finished the job off with a rotary tool and a jigsaw which surprisingly worked pretty well. And yeah, this looks awful, but don't worry, I have a plan for that later on. With that done, I can move on to sanding, no, just kidding, I forgot the lock on the door. Which was really easy to remove, partly because it doesn't work anymore. What wasn't easy to remove was the little HP logo. 
It was held in by some little plastic nubs, which I eventually just ground down until it fell off. I repeated that process for the transparent LED cover thing for the hard drive and network LEDs, as well as the power button. And with all of that out of the way, I could finally move on to sanding. There were a lot of nicks and scratches on the case, so I made sure to sand into the plastic to remove most of them, and then I masked off the inside of the case a bit just to avoid having a ton of overspray on the inside. After that, I hit everything with a few coats of primer, and then once again sanded everything down. To make the case stand out a bit, I decided to paint the top and front panel door white, with the rest of the case painted black. Almost like I was going for a stormtrooper vibe or something. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, wow Colton, the way you have that case propped up seems pretty sketchy, but don't worry, I know what I'm doing. It's not like right after the final code, I accidentally knocked it over off camera and then had to grab it quickly, leaving massive handprints in the side. Oh wait, no, that's exactly what happened. So let's do it all over again. While I was painting, I was also working on solutions for adding in the NUC board. I confirmed that the add to PSU module works fine with a 12 volt input, but doesn't work at all with just 5 volts. So I knew I'd have to order some parts to get that working later. In the meantime, I moved on to sorting out the front panel wiring. Luckily, I found a diagram on Reddit that got me most of the way there. The hard drive and network LEDs were pretty straightforward, and I confirmed the pins for those just using a CR2032 battery and a couple of wires. The LED for the HP logo was trickier since it's a tricolor LED, and I didn't have an easy way to make that functional. Fortunately, it's just a 5mm LED, so I decided to keep things simple and just swap it for a plain white LED. The power button has a bicolor LED, but fortunately, the NUC front panel supports a bicolor LED on its power LED pins. I hooked it up, and it worked like a charm, for a few minutes at least. While testing the actual switch for the power button, I noticed the power LED started flashing, and the system wouldn't post. Then I also noticed this poor little resistor which appeared to have met a pretty brutal end. In a panic, I desoldered the resistor, hoping it was causing a short or something that was preventing the system from posting, but it was definitely dead. <sighs> now I know just enough about electronics to get myself in trouble, which is why I assumed that I was doing something wrong when wiring this system up that led to its demise. But it wasn't until I was editing that I actually saw when the failure took place. You can clearly see here when I was unplugging the power supply that a spark flies off to the side. The same side of the board where that dead resistor was. When this happened, the only thing plugged into the board was the power LED. However, you can also see this orange wire flip over and find its way to the underside of the board where it wreaked havoc. Now I don't know exactly what that little resistor does, but I do know that it's really close to all of the VRMs for the CPU. And considering basically half of the capacitors on this board, specifically all the little ones under the CPU are shorted to ground, most likely this board is dead dead. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to be my incompetence that led to the death of this thing, and more so just my negligence, which is better. I didn't want my negligence to be the reason this project ended here though, so I found the only other Nook 11 board I could find, which was sadly only an i3 model, paid way more than I would like for both the board and rush shipping, and continued pushing forward. While the replacement board was on its way, I kept working with a 7th gen Nook I looked at recently. It doesn't have the B key or E key M.2 slots, but it still has a by 4 NVMe slot, a mostly identical front panel header, and a very similar physical layout. This let me continue my testing, and I found that both the power button and the LEDs all worked as expected. And you might have also noticed that I have the board lifted up off the table, and a slightly tidier work area. At this point I didn't know exactly how I killed the previous board, but I assumed it might have been due to all of the random junk I had all over the workbench. I try to learn my lesson when I can. With the front panel mostly sorted out, I moved on to figuring out the PCIe slot. I plugged in this M.2 to PCIe adapter, and hooked up an RTX 3050 which showed up with no issues in LSPCI. By that time I also had a 5 volt relay show up in the mail, and using the 5 volt pin on the front panel header, I was able to perfectly sync up the power supply with the NUC board. With all of the big technical issues sorted out, I could start planning out more details of exactly how I was going to connect everything up without it looking, well, like this. I also took some measurements of the motherboard tray, threw together a simple 3D model, and printed it out. Obviously this flimsy thing isn't going to work for the final design, but it would let me start planning out where things would need to go. Another thing I needed to sort out was that broken lock. I could have possibly had a replacement key made, but the lock seemed fairly mangled, and I didn't really care about locking the drives away. However, I did want the door to actually stay shut. 
Fortunately, I found a simple model online for a knob handle thing and printed that out as well. At this point, the case pieces were dry, so I buffed out some of the rough bits with a scotch bright pad and then hit everything with a few coats of a matte finish clear coat. The final result wasn't necessarily as good as I had hoped, but it was still much better than before. To wrap up this video, I wanted to get an idea of what the final result might look like. So I snapped the door panel back on, quickly just taped in the HP logo and power button, added the Blu-ray drive, attached the door and top cover, and yeah, not too bad. I think I definitely nailed the Stormtrooper vibe. Now there's still a long way to go with this project, but I feel like it's slowly coming together. I'm extremely excited to see the final result, and I hope you are as well. That will have to wait for the second half of this two-part series though, so if you're not already, make sure to get subscribed. That's about it for this one, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.